Live from Las Vegas, Nevada, it's theCUBE, covering EMC World 2015. Brought to you by EMC, Brocade, and VCE. Hi everybody, we're back. This is Dave Vellante. I'm here with my co-host, Stu, Stu Miniman. Stu, welcome. Thanks Dave, we're, it's Wednesday. It's, it's uh, getting Wednesday. a little it's long. Getting my little voice is doing okay, but I, I just messed up a name too. It's like, you know, we <laughs> are human here on the cubes, <laughs> you know, so. We are, we are not robots. Randy <laughs> Bias is here. Uh, he's the Vice President of Technology at EMC's Emerging Technology Division. Randy, welcome to theCUBE. Yeah, I have to say, you're the last so person I thought I'd be interviewing at EMC World 2015, but <laughs> congratulations. You this like Cloud years scaling. Ago? No. Come on, was... Dave, think back. I remember VMworld 2010, when we brought, like, it was like, who's theCUBE and what are they? So we brought all our friends from the cloud, and Randy was there. And yeah, I mean, I bumped into Randy so many times at Public House, and I used to work at EMC, and it would catch a little bit of grief sometime for some of the, you know, sand technologies and various things. I gave EMC so, a very hard time at about so 2010. Well, as I said, you're the last person. Space, open so. source, open stack. I'm like that. That's not going to happen. What? <laughs> you know, Cloud Sailing. Like, congratulations. Thanks. You know, how is it? How's it feel being inside? Uh, it's, the it's great. EMC is awesome. The way I like to tell people is, uh, you got the core technologies division, and then you have the emerging technologies division, whose job is dis to disrupt the core technologies division, and my job is to disrupt the emerging technologies division. <laughs> <laughs> so break glass, challenge assumptions, and help them be better business. Well, so you did a great keynote this morning, and a lot of themes that you typically don't hear at an EMC keynote. Like I said open source, talked a lot about open stack, yeah. talked a lot about the community. You know, that's your ethos, right? Yeah. You're bringing it in, how is it? Is they're not rejecting the organ? Oh no, <laughs> the, uh, the, there's a huge appetite at the leadership level to, to make a change. And I was telling somebody the other day that, uh, you know, the interesting thing about Project Copperhead, our open sourcing of Viper controller, is that there was no resistance at the leadership level. Everybody wanted to do it. And there was little resistance at the, at the rank and file engineer level. They were all happy to kind of have, be part of an open source project and, you know, kind of get it on their resume, right? Most of the resistance was in that middle tier, the people who want to have to, were on the hook for executing and are worried about, you know, what's going to happen to their margins and their business models and go to market and delivery times. You know, it was all that stuff. It was all the, the mechanics. And once you went through the educational process and we got to the other side, it was amazing because everybody across the entire org just lined up right behind it. And I had people giving pitches to other people that sounded like they came out of my mouth. I was like stunned. It so was what amazing. Do, what does it mean to open source the the Viper controller? Obviously, there's the whole community aspect. You're open sourcing yeah. that, but talk about that. But I'm also interested in the whole business model. What that what changes that portends? But start with what does it mean to open source the Viper controller? Yeah. So it was really interesting. You know, there were uh, there was a bunch of resistance and antibodies that came up as we started the process. And one of the concerns was, you know, we're going to lose, you know, business. And some people were asking maybe lose half of our customer base who would all use the open source. Well, when we went out and looked at the revenue distribution, it was the power law distribution curve where, you know, maybe 10% of our customers were providing 80% of the existing revenue for Viper, you know, very large scale deployments. And I said, those people are always going to pay us <laughs> because they're using it for certain in, in, in production. And the long tail, those are people who are kicking the tires. We give them the open source and make it easier for them to use it, build it into a big POC with very low friction, maybe add their own driver for their own obscure storage technology they want. And then when they're ready to go in production, they're going to come back to us. And you know, when people finally got it, 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 it was great, because they so realized there was no impact. So how about the licensing model? Has that changed to so It's a, it's a dual licensing model. We have commercial version, which is Viper Controller, and that's a standard enterprise license sold exactly as we've sold it before. And then there's Project Copperhead, which is the open source version of that, the exact same code base. And you get Co Project Copperhead off GitHub, and there's no support, but you have access to the code. You can, uh, you can replace one of them with the other, they're completely interchangeable. And that th that commercial model is a subscription model or is it the, the no, traditional? No, it's a standard enterprise software license, dual license model. So it's license enterprise and license here, maintenance? Or? Open source license here, yes. Yeah, so is that, now is that common in, in the open source land or is that yeah. different than? Uh, there's a bunch of people who do that, like Asterisk has a, has a, has a business model like that. Um, there's a bunch of different business models in open source land. I had to run everybody through those. The reason we chose this direction is that, you know, there's a lot of challenges to open sourcing in a company like EMC. Like how do we sell, you know, the Red Hat Enterprise subscription licenses, how do the salespeople get comped, over what time period do they get comped, all those. And so what we decided to do is kind of punt on that because it would slow us down. EMC's trying to move a lot faster. So with the dual licensing model allowed us to have the same sales motion, 
on the enterprise software license side, but have Project Copperhead open so that customers aren't logged in. And then over time, we can look at other options for selling kind of more Red Hat model. Yeah, Randy, I wonder if we could talk a little bit about stacks. So when, when I looked last year, one of the things that I thought was a you know moment that people go back and say, wow, that was really important and I can't believe I missed it, is EMC started selling commodity hardware. If you look at what was inside ECS, it was you know a standard ODM box. It was not kind of the traditional model of what I expect from EMC. Um, cloud scaling, you used a lot of those ODM type solutions to help build your stack. Give us a little insight as to you know how's EMC looking to approach some of these new models I heard a little bit about Caspian this week. You know, so how, how does that whole solution go together and how's kind of the EMC of kind of today and tomorrow different from the EMC of yesterday? Yeah, I mean, we really pioneered that. We brought like Quanta computers into Create Telecom and AT&T. So, you know, we were very comfortable with ODMs. And when I started that process, I was just trying to steal the page from Amazon and Google, you know. They seem to have figured something out. Let's just do what they did, right? So I'm not brilliant or anything. Um, so. You know, the thing is, is that if you go back and you look at the EMC leadership, Joe Tucci's telling everybody that customer, of the four things customers are asking for, number one, number two are open source software and COTS hardware. And so we're just trying to respond to that. That's what Project Caspian's about. It's like, look, customers want open source software, they want COTS hardware, they want to know they're not locked in, they've got a vendor neutral solution, they want to be able to get in under the hood if there's a problem, they want to know that they can kick you out if need be. And I think that that's great. He is probably the company of our size that can actually compete on innovation and service and support, and I think a lot of others can't. So we're actually going to help drive that. We want people to move more to open source and to COTS hardware. And Project Caspian, I, I don't want to get into too many details because we're just doing a sneak peek right now, but we're looking at you know really turning the tables on the old school good market for hardware appliances. You know, another way to really think about this is customers want open source software and COTS hardware, but here's the thing. Your average enterprise can't staff up like Google and Amazon and Microsoft. They can't become, they can't have those kinds of engineering teams. So how do you package something up for them so it's consumable for an enterprise, gives them those, the benefits of web scale and answers those needs? Well, I, I mean, to, to your point, Randy, on that, you look at the web scale guys, they really don't have infrastructure teams. They have teams of smart people that build an application that can really withstand, you know, little bits of things falling. I mean, the old chaos monkey, you know, going to kill everything down there. You know, infrastructure, you have people that bring in the racks and hook everything up, and at the end of the day, they pull out the stuff that died, but they're not there tweaking knobs and adjusting it, which right. is a very different model from what the enterprise and what IT traditionally has been in the enterprise right. They're today. treating the infrastructure like a power plant, and yeah. then, you know, if any of the pieces go down, they just find how to get more power from somewhere else. They don't, they're not sitting they're worrying about speeds and feeds constantly and trying to tune and groom everything. Let's talk about hyperconverged. Let's do so it. that's something that uh, you guys both talk about. You wrote a blog post, you commented, you guys argued. What's the crux of the argument? Randy, you feel like the, the, the way the industry has defined hyperconverged is off where it should be. I right? can't stand the way it's it's well, defined. Why? Well, the, the definition of hyperconverged even inside of EMC is that it's compute and storage combined. And this drives me crazy because, like, that means my laptops hyperconverged, mainframes hyperconverged. Like, it it, me, it makes the term hyperconverged useless. Now, some of the other definitions I've seen that are kind of around the edges are more like software-defined infrastructure or kind of like a more software-centric architecture of hyperconverged versus converged infrastructure. And I love that. I think that that makes sense, right? Because in that case, hyperconverged, if you think about it as being a software-centric architecture instead of a hardware-centric architecture, it tells you clearly how it's different from converged infrastructure, and it tells you what it it is, but then it doesn't necessarily mean that the compute and storage need to be together. If you go back and you talk to early VBlock customers, and this is less of a problem now, but you talk to early VBlock customers, they'll tell you they would run out of like storage oomph on a single VBlock, and they would go to VC, and VC would say, you need to buy another VBlock, even though you got RAM and yeah. CPU, right? Hyperconverged has the exact same problem. I mean, you can't scale, I mean, the way it is today with you know our competitors like Nutanix and SimpliVity, you can't scale the storage and compute independently. You got what you got. So if you run out of IOPS, yeah. So okay. So, so can, you're can I, that software should be the the it's answer, a software the, centric. Sort of yeah, 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 and, and absolutely, I agree 100. percent It's got to be about the software. It's not about the box. I've still yet to have a customer that came to come to me and said, you know, what's going to solve all my problems is convergence. You yeah. know, convergence is like you think of sheet metal and a box, and to the scalability uh, concern there. Um, 
many of the companies out there are having, I can have compute heavy or storage you know, heavy nodes. I, I, I can mix that so that when I create a pool, I will have some flexibility. It's not one you know, box that I can do that. I mean, even back in the early days of VCE, it was, you know, there was one model, can get it in one color, it's black, you know, so. VCEs matured over time. VCE software is helping to turn them into a platform that they can add compute separate or storage separate and put multiple different types of pieces together. We talked to Praveen about that earlier this week. Um, so, you know, it's early days and you know we look at some of these point solutions and for the mid-market, they might not need all of the things that we're talking about, but at least our vision as to what we call server SAN at Wikibon is it's about scalable architectures. It's about distributed things. I mean, that's the future of everything we've been talking about on IT the last few years from an application standpoint, and infrastructure needs to support that model. Yeah, I mean, I, for the mid-market, I think the way that the current hyper-converged offerings is, is fine, but the problem is, is that, you know, if you look at Google, it's not a homogenous system. It is what I call a, re a relatively homogenous system. And, and this is, it's hard for people to understand because in the old way of doing things, like when we went into Korea Telecom, they had 13,000 servers with 526 hardware configurations across 26 vendors compared to Google's 10 hardware configurations. But Google doesn't have one hardware configuration. And one of the problems with the current go-to-market hyperconverge is they kind of want to sell you unicorns, like Seth did in the open source storage market, where they can believe that you know there's one homogenous system that's going to service all your needs. And the reality is, is that there's a variety of workloads, so you still need tiering of storage, you still need compute that's designed for high CPU, high memory, you need to scale storage and compute and networking all independently. And most importantly, you got to separate the control plane from the data plane. When you run the APIs and the control software in a hyper-converged system on the same place as the data plane, it's a massive security yeah, risk. But it so sounds so like hyper-siloed managed through software, is that it? Hyper-siloed managed through software, yeah, I love it. So, so I call it hyper-optimized. If you look at what Amazon does right, they, they make a specific configuration that's going to live in one environment, which is theirs, and for a single application, and they build that at massive scale. The problem is the enterprise is very different. They can't build infrastructure for every single application. That's right. Virtualization helped give us you know, a platform that we could put right. lots of they applications used to, in but there. Virtualization's the optimization. We wanna, we've been trying to, I mean, I don't know, I spent a decade trying to get people out of that silo of let's make you know a temple for each application and tweak all those knobs. You know, so do we want to go back and no, that, so no, the difference is is that the silos, the control planes were siloed. Yeah. yeah. That's the fundamental problem, right? So all the management on the top end, on the in the user interface, and also on the back end was all siloed, right? And when people complain about silos, they're complaining about the management of the silos. Like right now, they've got array after array after array, and they have to manage each array independently, and it and it kills them, right? Now, in a more modern world, we have silos still, but I like to think of them as sort of tiers for different kinds of workloads, but the control plane on the front end and the back end is actually a single uniform control plane. And that's so a manager of a manager though, or? No, I think you look at something like OpenStack and that's like a great way to sort of have like a common control plane. Like, Good example, right. If you've, got a, if you've got OpenStack and a customer can see in the service catalog that they can hire a high, or they can order a high IOPS you know, block volume or a high capacity one, and they don't care. They just want to know that the handshake they made in the API to like get the, the block device, you know, comes through. On the back end, that might be extreme IO in one place and scale IO for the other, right? That's what I mean. You're going to have different technologies for different workloads. You can't collapse it all. You can for a specific use case, like I'm going to put like hyperconverge under VDI. Great use of hyperconverged, right? But you're not going to put hyperconverged across your data center for all your workloads. It's not going to happen. The workloads are too different. All right, Randy Vias, we're out of time. We got to go. The disruptor inside the company that's disrupting itself for the next disruptive age. <laughs> Randy Vias, thanks very much for coming on the cube. Stu, appreciate your help, and uh, wish we had more time so you guys could get into it. But, we'll we'll uh, get into it more in OpenStack in Vancouver. All right, keep it right there. We're back with our next guest. This is the cube. We're live. EMC World 2015. Right back. <laughs>